Hello, I'm Mike Coleman. This is a re-recording of a talk which I gave to the Border History Society in 2018. It's the history of communal land tenure in the Eastern Cape. It's my view of it, and it is as appropriate to a bunch of historians, it is in chronological order. That's a map of land tenure broadly in the Eastern Cape. And we can see quite clearly there, the Western two thirds of the province falls under freehold tenure, mostly commercial farms with an emphasis on the one third of the people of the province there are particularly urban in the larger towns like Klobecha and East London. The Eastern one third made up of the former Transkei and Siskei, is almost all communal land under different forms of tenure that we'll come to in detail later. There, two thirds of the people of the province live and they are particularly rural. So we hear about land rights, land tenure, land use. They're all very much connected, but they also slightly different. All the communities that have lived in the Eastern Cape over 100,000 years or more, all had a system of some kind of recognized tenure, which means the holding of land in one form or another. The holding reflects the land use and vice versa. And individual communities and individual people have particular land rights in those areas. So the San, the Khoi, Koza, Whites, all had a system. How did it work? Why did it change? And what do we do about it now? And all of this now sits in the context of South African law, which is a particular historical blend, which is unique in the world, of customary law, of Roman Dutch law, and English law. So this is the history of the land tenure and the land administration that goes with it on the communal land of the Eastern Cape in the form of historical layers. Looking at that picture, you might think, that's what Viv Mostert used to persuade me to give this talk. But it's a way of looking at the history because it is a succession of layers. So if we start at the bottom here, we talk about prehistory, which is a phrase I've never quite understood. I've not un never been sure what's history and what's prehistory. Then we have customary tenure. Then we have colonial tenure, we have apartheid land tenure, and we have land tenure post-1994. And above that, sitting on the top in all the curls and fancy bits, we have what might be termed in South African language, the present Khamors. So let's look at it chronologically. The first layer, customary tenure, by San Bushmen, who were hunter-gatherers. A hundred thousand years, at least, when there was plenty of land, very few people, and society was arranged in family groups. And the most important people in those groups were the women. Classically, when you see photograph of San, they are the men with their bows hunting a giraffe through the bush. But in fact, 60% of the food for those people was provided by the women, as here, digging up roots and collecting felt cores. So if we look at the distribution in the Eastern Cape, this is a map from Robin Derricourt's work in the 1970s. The white dots represent the rock art sites which are 
the essentially the best record we have of the distribution of the sand people. But there is no doubt that they moved across the whole area, particularly depending on the seasons. In the mountains, particularly in winter, obviously, are that much colder. And there is plenty of evidence that they moved down to the coast and used the coastal resources. And from these people, we have a very long archaeological history in South Africa. This rock, if you look at it carefully, with its line drawings on it in red ochre, is the oldest known artifact in the world with human drawing on it. You might say, how do we know that? Well, the archaeologists can identify its age from the layer in which it occurred. And if you want an expert, then you ask an engineer. So I asked my friend Dennis Walters, uh, what does this drawing look like to you? And Dennis had absolutely no hesitation. He said, it's quite clearly an engineering drawing. I said to him, but Dennis, how can you, how can you say a thing like that? He said, it's simple. It looks exactly like one of my drawings. But the sand bushmen in our part of the world sadly no longer exist. And that date of 1988 records the death of the last genuine sand bushmen in the Drakensberg of the Eastern Cape. Much more recently, the Khoi pastoralists became the predominant people in the area. From about 2000 before present or more, they moved into it from the west and into our area. How far did they get? We'll have a look at in a moment. Their land use then differed because they were now pastoralists. In other words, they kept livestock. They kept sheep. Certainly the records for that are somewhat earlier, around about 2,000 years before present. And then records of Koi cattle from at least 1,500 years back. They moved seasonally, but they moved in larger groups than the sand people, what were large enough to fall under the classification of tribes with tribal territories, with recognizable boundaries, and therefore a somewhat different form of tenure. And in our part of the Eastern Cape, the Gonokka people persisted as clearly identifiable communities in the, into at least the 1820s. How do we know where they were? Well, my friend, Jim Feely, working in the Transkei on the occurrence, looking at an archaeological investigation of who lived where, when. Jim picked up on the Khoi River names, and you see them here in blue on this older map of mine. And I noticed the distribution coincided almost exactly with that of the sheep dominant districts in present times, which we were looking at in 1979, 1980, looking at the economy of Transkei. And if we put the two together, I think it's fairly obvious that they coincide as one would expect, unless the environment has changed radically in the meantime, which there is evidence that it hasn't done. Then the Khoi penetrated pretty much as far as the present day boundary of KZN and the Eastern Cape, in other words, around about the Omzimbubu. At the same period, there were early Iron Age settlements in the deeper river valleys, coastal river valleys of the Eastern Cape, represented here on these early Iron Age sites by the red dots, which are what Jim Feely picked up in his investigation riding across the Transkei on his, on his motorbike with his wife to provide support and backup. And this is the only 
known distribution of early Iron Age sites from round about 400 to 900 AD. And they are to be found as far south as East London. The furthest south site is actually just outside East London on the other side of the Buffalo River. So again, these sort of sites imply a different kind of society. These were farmers with crops and some livestock. And th that implies village settlements. And the sites of their settlements, like this one on the Umzimbubu, which is still occupied and still farmed, as you can see, they had small grains, they had cattle and goats, they smelted iron, they used pottery, they lived in small settled villages, and therefore, again, they had recognizable boundaries for their, for their communities. Then as we get into the later Iron Age, on to the present day, with the arrival of later Iron Age Bantu peoples from the east, mainly now in general terms called Tosa people, but including a number of other groups, as we know, particularly from KwaZulu. They are farmers with livestock, with cattle being dominant. They prefer dispersed settlement, unlike the early Iron Age people who lived in nucleated villages. The Kosa people prefer dispersed settlement. I'm aware you will immediately say, but that's not how they live there. We'll come to that in a moment as to how that happened. But they, first of all, settled in the coastal areas and only about 300 years or so ago moved up onto the plateau of what's now Transkai. And one of the things that inhibited them was the lack of wood and the fact that in winter it gets very much colder than it does down towards the coast. And their customary tenure involved larger tribal territories than the Khoi, but still in a sense migratory because they were pushing westwards all the time. Each generation pushed a little bit further to the west and they also moved their cattle seasonally according to the winter up to the mountains and back down to the sweet fell. And the climate becomes an important factor here. You might have noticed those early Iron Age settlements that they get they move closer and closer down the valleys towards the coast as they get towards the west, towards East London. And the blue line on this map is the 500 millimeter ISO height. And that's crucial because in, as a rule of thumb, to the east of that, you can grow crops and to the west of it, you can't, you're dependent only on livestock. So for the Khoi, that was a looming problem. And their movement west of what's now called the Great Fish River was hampered by the lack of rainfall inland, and most of their movement was along the coast through the Searfelt. In addition to the quantity of rainfall, there is the question of its season. And as you go westwards, not only does the rainfall decrease, but it becomes all year rainfall, which gives you a different farming environment. But characteristically, these late Iron Age peoples lived in dispersed settlements with Anguni adapted cattle. They used ochre, which Af people in Africa have used by record from mining in Eswatini, have been mining it for at least 40,000 years. There are stone querns and, and grinding stones that go with them. The huts were built by the women and the men 
the women themselves here in very old traditional leather skirts. And they had modified what is now modified traditional or customary tenure. It still persists. It is the predominant form of tenure in one kind or another. The land is held by the chief on behalf of the community. It's not owned by the chief. The kraal and Arab site and arable land are allocated through a nested hierarchy from the chief down to the headman to subheadman to head of household and by him to his wives. Each full community member, in other words, male and married, has a bundle of land rights. And notice these are land rights attached to the person and not land rights attached to the land plot itself as under Western custom. It includes rights to residence, to plowing, to grazing, to fuel wood, to building material, to water, to felt cost, to med medicinal plants, access and participation in the community and any decisions that are made there. It is very secure tenure. It is not ownership, but there are no formal records. The concept of land ownership by independent by independent people outside the group or alienation of land is foreign. It's an inconceivable idea. Some of you might struggle to understand it, but if, like me, you have ancestry back in the Anglo-Saxon era, then Falkland was a perfectly reasonable concept. And it is now, in a sense, it exists still as crown or state land. So we have land, a group, in group ownership or holding. We have the umzi or homestead for the family. And that live, livestock is held individually. So it's a complex system of tenure. It's shown itself to be very adaptable to informal tenure arrangements. In the sense, in the good Afrikaans sense of Buremaka Plan, and forms the foundation of a flexible, persistent social system which is still very strong. Eastern Cape itself is very different from KZN or the Unganyama Trust Land as it is held now and is subject to some very serious court cases at the present time. It is diverse, it's flexible. And in the Eastern Cape especially, it is deliberately not written down and codified. In KwaZulu-Natal, it was in the 1870s. In the Eastern Cape, it was not, with the influence of people like Thomas Uppington and Walter Stanford. And when he was still alive, I spoke to Chief Burns and Tumashi, who was one of the senior traditional leaders of the Koza people and particularly held in deep respect for his knowledge of traditional custom. And he refused and explained why. He said, you cannot write down customary law because if you do so, you freeze it. And flex flexibility is the basis of customary law. It changes with time and with people and you cannot freeze it by writing it down. And since that time, the Constitutional Court, of course, has confirmed this concept as well. So after a very long period of history, we have the arrival of whites and colonial tenure. And this now makes obviously major changes to our part of the world from the late 1700s onwards. So we have a shifting frontier, and that is crunch time. The expansion westwards by the Bantu people is reversed, partly because of the white black confrontation, but also because of that 500 millimeter 
rainfall limit, the two of them together bring the westward expansion of white peoples to a halt. But notice some of the Kosa people had penetrated way west of the Great Fish River. By historical record, we know that they were well west of there by 1700. One of the consequences of this was the genocide of the sand people by both black and white. The absorption of the Khoi people into the Kosa communities. The influence of missionaries and adventurers who tended to be the first white people into the area dominated by the Kosa. The nine border wars, the occupation and the annexation shown by the dates on this map moving steadily eastwards until the final annexation of Fonda Land in 1894. And following on from occupation and annexation by white colonial rule, obviously, was administration. And there is the last king of the Onopondo before annexation. The colonial administration of Transkai territories, seen here, for example, in Proclamation 110 of 1879, which is very little changed, it effectively is still in place. The right of allotting the land is vested in the governor. In other words, no longer in the chief. For the purpose of such allotment, the territory shall be subdivided into as many districts or wards as may from time to time to be found necessary. This subdivision shall be made by the chief magistrate, subject to the approval of the governor, but effectively by the chief magistrate, and a headman shall be nominated to the superintendents of each subdivision. Notice the change here to the headman as the main agent rather than the chief. This was quite deliberate colonial administration. And each area, each location, administrative area was gazetted in the government gazette with a description. They were surveyed quite accurately. And this description here pleases me because one of my areas of interest is soil erosion. And here you'll notice how important dongas can be. The Zadungeni donga thence down that donga to its junction with the Intabani stream. And each of these boundaries can still be traced. They still exist to this day. So what did land administration consist of? You've got the concept of crown land, superseding that of communal land holding. You have a magistrate for each district. You have wards or administrative areas, the locations. You have a census, you have land survey, and the records and the maps and the laws that go with it. And of course, as with any government, you have tax. But increased land pressure results in smaller fixed boundaries. So you can see here on this map of Transkai, each of the locations, very much smaller unit than a district, and each district has 20, 30, 40 administrative areas, each with its own headman and its fixed boundaries. Those boundaries were based on the existing communities of the 1870s and 80s when the first magistrates were appointed. There was still room between settlements at that stage for some hunting and some movement of livestock. And the predominant form of tenure the formal form of tenure then became a permission to occupy, a PTO. The colonial administrators formalized customary tenure into PTOs, permission to occupy, with a series of government proclamations from the 1870s onwards. And many of those 
in the Cape, in the Eastern Cape here, are still in force. They are still the law. So a PTO is a permit for occupation, not ownership, for occupation of unregistered state or trust land for a specific purpose under section four, which is the common section for either residential or arable allotment. Unlike freehold title, it's a life, it's a land right attached to the person, not to the parcel of land. And that is one of the difficulties of changing from communal tenure to freehold tenure. It was issued to a head of household, i.e. black, male, married, member of the community. It was free. It was issued for life. It is not transferable, inheritable, or usable for financial security. And it was identified when it was issued by agreement from the traditional authority. The agricultural development team went out and chained it, two chains by two chains, 44 meters by 44 meters, or effectively, sorry, 44 yards by 44 yards, which is effectively 50 meters. It was allocated. The PTO was issued to the holder. It was mapped on one to 18,000 maps in the district office. It was entered into the land register in the magistrate's office. And the system was cheap, simple, understood by everybody. There's an example of a so-called illegal permission to occupy because it's issued after 1996. But you'll notice it's issued by the Department of Agriculture of the Eastern Cape. It is a quite clearly identified residential allotment. And it is issued to a single person with their ID number on the date. And it is for residents and it is 46 by 46 meters. It was issued from Mount Freer and it had an official stamp on it. But in fact, what was happening by that time, these are the land registers for Mount Freer, looked after by a faithful civil servant who has no computer, no vehicle, and in practice administers about 17,000 PTOs. Then we came up with a problem of different forms of land tenure and overlapping land rights. As you can see here, the red areas and the PTOs overlap in some cases over existing quit rent title. What's quit rent title, you might ask? Well, quit rent is a very ancient form of title which was used particularly to create black independent farmers and reduce the chief's powers yet again in a different way. It is registered individual title in the deeds registry. It includes the payment of an annual rental to government. So it was very similar to the old uh, East India, East India company payments. And it is inheritable but it cannot be sold or transferred out of the system. It's a compromise form of title tenure. It was used in the 1700s by the Dutch East India Company to maintain some control over distant trick boers and called at that stage loan farms. Quitrent is still widespread in the surveyed nine southwestern districts of Transkei following the Glen Grey Act of 1895. It was supposedly going to be changed to, to freehold title by the Upgrading of Land Tenure Rights Act 112 of 1992, but unfortunately that is still not law in Transkei. There have been three amendments to the Act since then, and each time it failed to sort out the mess. White farms under quit rent 
were abolished back in the 1930s in our part of the world when they were deemed to be freehold tenure without any kind of problem. So we end up with land tenure PTO proclamations still in force, but not administered since 1994. So we see that the tenure varies in different parts of the province. In the western part, significantly in white, we have freehold tenure. In Siskai and the pale blue there, we have customary and freehold tenure because that fell under the South African government notice R188 for land tenure. But that does not apply in Transkai. And the different parts of Transkai fall under PTO proclamations of varying dates from 1921 onwards. The majority of it under 26 and 1936. And Tralanga there, you can see 170 of 1922 has its very own proclamation. But in general, nobody has the actual statistics, but our estimation of the numbers are that there are approximately 100,000 households with customary unrecorded tenure. There are approximately 100,000 quitrent titles still held in the Amtata Deeds Registry. And there are at least 300,000 households holding PTOs. Then we get the third layer of land tenure in the apartheid era from 1948 onwards when we have our homelands or Bantu stands. We have white farms expropriated for consolidation. Some of you listening to this talk, I have no doubt, come from families which were affected and have memories of that period. If you come from the petty district of Siskai, for example, when it was incorporated into Siskai. During the earlier period in response to population increase and the increasing soil erosion, we then had the replanning and the betterment, so-called betterment acts plus PTOs of planning or what is locally called in Koza Trust with allocated residential arable and grazing in nucleated villages. In other words, the traditional dispersed settlement was moved into consolidated nucleated residential villages. And this led to an enormous amount of political resistance, epitomized, for example, in the Pondo Rebellion of 1960. So from dispersed rural settlements such as that, we go to consolidated villages where everybody lives next door to everybody else. And then we have post-1994, the land tenure of the PTO proclamations is still legally in place, but is not administered on the instruction of the Minister of Land Affairs. But the Provincial Department of Agriculture continued to issue PTO proclamations until about 2012. Whether they have legal force, of course, is a constitutional question. Then land administration itself which was carried out from the magistrate's office, was abandoned in 1996 as the magistrates were told to get back into court and stop doing all these additional functions they'd been doing for more than 100 years. The Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act was issued, which is about two and a half pages, but is a very straightforward protection of communal land rights, but it has to be reissued by Parliament every year. And still, nearly 30 years later, we're still doing that. The crucial factor is that there has been no land tenure reform on communal land since 1994. Mostly because of the lack of political will, but one has to be clear that it is also a very complex land reform to carry out. 
the restitution land reform has been applied in some areas and some of the biggest rural cases were in the Eastern Cape, like at Dweset Kwebe or Mkambati. But strangely, after then Vice President, Deputy President Zuma attended the celebrations in the late 1990s and handed over supposedly title deeds to the participants at Dweset Kwebe, the title to that land actually has not been transferred, partly because of opposition from traditional leadership, which has increased over the years. As a consequence of this, we end up with the illegal sale of sites by headmen. We have a complete lack of planning law because the planning law as it existed pre-1994 was repealed in the late 90s, but it was not replaced until 2016 by the Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act, but it was only replaced in theory because the provisions of that act are very difficult to apply to communal land. At the same time, we have a bundle of acts like the Communal Land Rights Act, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, the Traditional Courts Bill, and so on and so on, all based on apartheid thinking and laws put in place by the post-94 government, but based, for example, on things like the 1951 Bantu Authorities Act. And the consequence we see in places like Tolabeni over mineral rights when the minerals and energy department get involved. And so we come to the final layer, which is the present commerce, from 1994 onwards, we have the Municipal Demarcation Board totally ignoring the existing boundaries of districts and replacing them with wall-to-wall -wall municipal boundaries, but without removing the underlying boundaries. So we now have a situation where we have magisterial districts still existing, but for most administrative purposes now, we have local municipalities. The administrative area or location boundaries now include and don't run with council wards. We have municipal councils and we have traditional councils. We have no land tenure reform and until very recently we have no rural planning law. If we take an example, you can see here, Mbuchi administrative area number 10 has been resurveyed, and now in the Surveyor General's terms, it's no longer Mbuchi administrative area number 10, it is Farm 44 remainder. And it is divided into three municipal wards. So the headman of the admin area is still in place. The boundaries of the admin area are still in place, but it is, has three different councillors responsible at local government level for different parts of the ward, overlapping the jurisdiction and authority of the headman. If we have a look at an example of communal land tenure, if we go to the area close to Coffee Bay on the coast, which I'm sure some of you know, then we have administrative areas approximately 130 years old, resurveyed in 2006 with the blue lines, renamed, renumbered as farms, because that's the only thing that the survey system understands. There is an example from the boundary of communal area and white commercial farms. You can see all the little gray boundaries there of individual land as opposed to the communal land across the river. If we take a slice of communal land tenure finally and look, have a closer up look at that area around Coffee Bay, we see Coffee Bay itself with demarcated, not, not freehold sites, we have a couple of little communal and a couple of little freehold properties. 
the majority of it is communal or state trust land under customary PTO, under customary tenure or PTO. We have state land in the little purple patches there. Those of you who have been to stay at Ocean View Hotel have stayed on one of those patches. That is state land, which is surveyed and registered. In addition, we have state land, which is surveyed, but unregistered for various schools or police stations. We have state forest surveys, which strangely don't appear on the Surveyor General's maps. We have titled, surveyed, registered trading station sites. We have private, surveyed, unregistered sites in Coffee Bay itself. And interestingly, if you follow the blue 2006 survey line, we have some areas there which are apparently outside South Africa, so we can only assume they're part of Western Australia. And we also have a little portion up in the top right-hand corner there, which used to be in the neighboring district, but now according to the new survey is actually in a new district across the other side of the Amtata River. If you think this is a problem, this is nothing new. This is an irrigation map from 1700 BC, nearly 4,000 years ago, which is perfectly clear about the situation of the irrigation sites and the channels and the flow in the channels and the crops that are being grown and who grows them and where he lives. And they're all particularly recorded on the tablet on the right hand side there, which is effectively the same thing as a title deed. And the system has not really changed in all that time, except that that map from nearly 4,000 years ago is still perfectly visible and perfectly valid because it's on the clay tablet. Whereas just recently, a whole portion of the Registrar General's system, the deed registrar's system on computers has actually been lost and disappeared. So there we have our land tenure situation for the communal areas. Thank you for listening patiently. And I would previously, when I presented it live, expected questions and rotten tomatoes and discussions, only two of which I received, fortunately. Thank you very much. I hope you found it interesting. Questions, questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> Do you think this is a viable way of sorting it out for what would it take? You know, take a lot of investment to run Next question. <laughs> <laughs> if there are ways of sorting it out, then I would be out of a job. Most of my life I've spent trying to sort out some of these problems. Um, as the politicians would say, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if we if we start in with what we've got and we recognize customary tenure more than we do at the moment, right? The Constitutional Court has now said, yes, it's flexible living, but remember, no, you won't remember that far back, the very first slide I put up said South African law consists of Roman Dutch law, particularly to do with property. English law, right, so that we could well, we could fix the bits of Roman Dutch law that we didn't like, and it consists of customary law. Now it's a blend of all three. What we should be doing under land tenure reform, which hasn't happened, 
And nobody in that department has the imagination or the ability to do anything about it. Is we should be taking customary law and the colonial PTO system and saying, how do we modernize this? Right? Let's do what the colonial administrators did to customary law. They formalized it. They followed the existing community boundaries. But they put formal boundaries into the Gazette. They put land registers in place in every magisterial office so that you could check whose land was what. There were no arguments. Right? We could do that by formalizing that part of it. But we need to recognize that that living law needs a system which goes from basically a squatter camp site right through to Sandton City, all in one system, <coughs> which is what many of our acts promise, a unitary system, right? We've got the new spatial planning and management, land use management act, which says that that's the objective, is a unitary system. And the act itself then promotes an apartheid system, literally two systems. It needs to be on a, Mike, what's the right word? It, it's not a sliding scale, but it needs to be, a, thank you, Ron. Ah, here we are, there's Roman Dutch education for you. A continuum. Right? That sounds Latinate enough, doesn't it? It needs to be on a continuum, recognizing more and more formalized kinds of land holding. Right? And quite a lot of your freehold title, so-called, also needs sorting out because there's some, there's some problems with that too. We are fortunate that we have pretty much independent surveyors general and deeds registrars, okay? They are much like the national chapter nine institutions, that they've got a lot of elbow room and a lot of flexibility. They can put their foot down and say, no, that is not happening, or this is happening. Why? Because I said so, and I'm the registrar of deeds, right? Now that's a hell of a good thing, in a good civil service. It can also be a hell of a bad thing. Um, so we need to formalize those things. Communal land itself, the rural communal land, is real, in spite of what I've just shown you, is relatively straightforward to deal with, compared with trying to sort out the informal dungeons, the informal settlements. My role sitting in the front row would be very worried because that's more his baby than mine. Right? You take people in informal settlements, right? How long has Duncan Village been there? A damn sight longer than any of us in this room. Pre Second World War, isn't it? No. He spent vacation but earlier than that. Right? And it's still an informal settlement. So we need, we need a system that can deal with all these things. Now the, the good thing is that we've got deed registrars and surveyor general who have modern, up-to-date, now electronic systems. And they have both assured us that they can deal with the amount of work involved. If you take the numbers of properties there are in South Africa, they run into the millions anyway, right? We're talking like 8 million properties. All with their own record in the deeds registry, their own survey, survey diagram and so on. To do more of it for the communal areas is relatively minor. And if they could do it in the 1860s with Scottish surveyors, <laughs> we ought to be able to do it now. That's one of the reasons why, if you look at the map where you go into certain 
urban areas, you will find almost every single farm name is some kind of obscure Scots name. <laughs> so yeah, it can be done. It doesn't need to cost a lot of money compared to what we see going into things like Sili or Mundubi. Um, at the moment, the land reform budget is 0.4 of the national budget, 0.4 of a percent of the national budget. Right? That's the same as Zimbabwe has had for the last 40 years. Right? So that's the kind of land reform program we've got and we're going to keep going with. Follow up question. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned that, I mean, I'm sure they're very, they're very similar problem with the, with the Red Indians. So how are they having a comparison? Because you said they they lost 40% of it. The Americans have a much more decentralized system to begin with. Right? They have a system of, they have a system of courts and of land tenure, which is very much more localized than ours is. So, in a sense, at that level, it's easier to adapt. Our problem in South Africa is that since 94, everything is totally centralized in Pretoria. Right? It used to be bad under apartheid. But now it's just unreal. Everything is centralized. And that's a real problem. Because you can't get anything done unless you can go talk to Mr. Ramaphosa and was going to do that. Otherwise, nothing happens. All the government departments at the moment are on no speaks, no do. Right? Because there's an election coming up next year. So nothing's happening. And the department responsible for this is about to disappear after the elections. Right? The new minister is a caretaker minister. <coughs> She's there until the department disappears and gets absorbed into, well, we're not sure. Because the new Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act uh, is being administered by the Presidency and by the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform and the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Don't look at me like that. It's not a problem to have three departments administering one act. It's innovative. <laughs> and only one of them actually has anything to do with local municipalities, which is where Spruva has to be implemented. Yeah. Sorry, I think you're always getting in on this at about time we had tea. <laughs> Seriously, couldn't. Any more questions? to, for health reasons, move to the country. 
coast. So he moved to port, near Port St. John's, and then he um, acquired a, a sea cottage at Augusta now was site, a PTO. I don't know if they issued that in 1920. But um, that's how I met Mark Coleman for the first time, because I wanted permission to knock down a bottle and door storeroom and move it 10 meters east. Still within my boundary, but you had to get permission from Land Affairs. And Mike was very busy, very harassed, and not at all interested in speaking to some whitey one pretty old thing sorted out. It was in some fancy office in the bottom of the town. Anyway, um, I persisted, I persisted, and I persisted, and eventually Mike said, yes, well, oh, what, 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 what site are you? And I said, site 23. And he said, you lie, can't possibly be, because there are only 14 legal sites <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> there were only 14 cottages with PTOs, but there were 25 sites. Some of those sites were surveyed on a cliff face that you couldn't find. But anyway, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, these are just personal um, flippant observations and things I thoroughly enjoyed about you. But on a more serious note, on behalf of us all, I'd like to thank you for what you put into your talk. We have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you.